what should be the right approach when they look at observability where there were sometimes a lot of things overlap. Yeah. Uh, which overlaps means cost, wasted resources. So, I mean, of course, you might have some bias because you're in the space, but what would be the right approach when they are looking at observability and solving those problems? I think there's a, um, Charity Majors is starting to write about this a little bit. And a few other people, I've seen a few other blogs recently about this. And I think what we're seeing is that the industry as a whole is coming around to this idea that it's time to version observability. And it's time to kind of say like, there's observability 1.0, and then there's something over here that's observability 2.0. And there's a maturity model that fits into that. Because a lot of people are on observability 1.0, right? They have, they're able to you know, manage the complexity of Kubernetes through traditional sorts of monitoring and alerting tools. They're able to you know, figure out when incidents are happening and how to solve those incidents. But when you think about what is the difference between these, like where am I trying to get to? you're trying to answer bigger questions and cost is a huge one of those. The problem with observability 1.0 is that your cost is generally exponential based on you know, your traffic or whatever. The more complex your system gets, the more you end up paying for data. And the only way you can control that cost is really by losing resolution, right? So you do pretty blind, you know, you're blindly um, reducing metric cardinality or you're dropping a lot of logs through heavy sampling or you're you know, doing kind of head sampling of traces. And the more you apply these cost controls, it affects your ability to actually understand your system and understand what's going on. And I think the biggest thing that changes as you move up this maturity model and you go from observability 1.0 to 2.0 is that in 2.0, your costs are managed and controlled and they don't, they grow linearly with your traffic, right? Because every point of data that is coming out of a sort of an observability 2.0 workflow is going to be valuable data in some way. Because you have, one is that you've been intentional about saying, well, why am I doing this? So in the observability 1.0 world, you're collecting data for the sake of collecting data, right? You're getting these signals because that's what you're supposed to do. And if you have enough data, then you have some internal confidence that, oh, I can, when something does break, I can dig through it and find out what's going on. In an observability 2.0 world, you're doing a lot more thinking ahead of time and saying like, okay, what is these, what data do I need to understand the performance of my system as it relates to these sort of business outcomes, right? I want to ensure that customers are happy. I want to ensure that um, my shopping cart that when I add something to the shopping cart, it's successful in under 50 milliseconds, 99% of the time. Whatever goals I'm setting, that these goals are business goals at the end of the day. They map to revenue. They map to everyone getting their paycheck and you know continuing to have a great, happy life. But that's a that that's why you're doing observability, right? Like we can put a lot of stuff in front of it, and we can put a lot of abstractions and say like, oh no, observability is this or the other. But really, it's about I'm trying to run a system, and that system to support a business. Like, that's how I should think about observability. I should say, okay, what's the stuff that I need to actually care about in order to accomplish those business goals? What data do I need to collect and store? How long do I need to collect and store? And then once you have those goals defined, it's a lot easier to go back and say, okay, how can we make systems, make sort of automated systems that are able to look at the data I have map it to those goals and then automatically give me the data I need without me having to you know, do this sort of very rough sampling or um, upfront decisions and have that be dynamic. And that's where I see a lot of places going right now. And there are people that are doing this. A lot of them tend to be in like really, really big companies. You know, you look at like what Meta is doing. They have like an incredibly mature observability program. They're doing observability 2.0. You look at, you know, maybe a Microsoft, parts of them certainly doing this. They're using AI, they're using all of this stuff. But it's really hard to get to if you're not that kind of scale. And I think this is the big challenge that I see a lot of engineering leaders, um, you know, CIOs and CTOs and people like that grapple with is building that kind of observability is really, really, really expensive. And it's very expensive to maintain. So if you have, you know, 10 headcount this year, are you gonna spend it all on people not, you know, are you gonna spend all of that on 10 engineers to work on your observability stack? 
or are you going to spend it on 10 engineers to build features and help you innovate? I, I know which one I would pick. 